What is up everybody and welcome back to my channel. This week we are going to be speaking about a case that has been very controversial to some. It has raised a lot of different questions about the policies within police departments, um, the indifference that seems to be in some police departments, and it has caused a lot of positive change in Northern California. We're going to be speaking about the unsolved murder of 19-year-old David Josiah Lawson, who went by DJ in April of 2017. Now, so many things should have been done differently in DJ's case, and all of these devastating missteps have now just led to this muddied and complicated case that has sat stagnant for years. Right now, the most important thing that can be done in this case is for witnesses to come forward. Hopefully, someone caught this murder on camera. This occurred at a party with well over 100 people. You cannot tell me in this day and age, even in 2017, that someone did not have their phone out. There wasn't a single witness. My goal is to bring awareness to this case and to hopefully get this video in the right hands of someone that maybe will rethink their silence and be able to provide provide some sort of justice for Josiah and closure for his family. So DJ, I will refer to him as that for the rest of the video. Honestly, I've kind of on and off been calling him David, DJ, and Josiah throughout all of my research. So if I switch it up, just know those are the three things that I may be calling him during this video. Um, but he was raised by a single mother in Southern California. His mom's name is Charmaine. And honestly, she is a force to be reckoned with. I have at this point watched different interviews with her and read a lot of her open letters. I have all of that listed down below. DJ was always known as a really sweet family oriented guy. He had a great relationship with his mother and he had two younger siblings that he tried really hard to be a good role model to. They looked up to him a ton. The whole family spent a lot of time together just in general they would love doing movie nights and game nights and they made sure to eat dinner with each other as frequently as they could he had a really close group of friends growing up and everyone that knew him said that dj always had a smile on his face he was always a voice of reason during troubling times he was known as a peacemaker he loved being in nature again growing up in southern california he spent a lot of time adventuring he also excelled academically he was very smart and he also played sports in school. He played football. He ran track and field. His mother dotes on all of his different academic awards that he received along with graduating with honors. His mother said, and I quote, DJ was a passionate leader, a visionary. He sought to improve the lives of all that he touched and desired a career in public service. He exemplified ambition, love, and compassion. He was an outstanding son, big brother, grandson, nephew, and mentor. So in 2015, DJ was preparing to head to college. He kind of was trying to get a grasp on what exactly he wanted to do. He knew that he wanted to be able to help the public. And so he attended a college fair at a local high school and he went with his mother. And she says that right away, he was drawn to Humboldt State University, otherwise known as HSU. Now this university is relatively small compared to a lot of universities. I believe there's usually only around 6,000 students and it sits 90 miles south of Oregon, right by the Redwood National and State Parks. And the university sits in the town of Arcata. And this town, according to everything I looked up online, allegedly is known for its progressive politics, which is ironic, and being a safe place to relax and enjoy life by the ocean. Despite being someone who loved being a city kid, he loved growing up in the city where he was, he just felt this peace in Arcata. He liked the landscape. He liked the more relaxed lifestyle, the smaller school. There was just this beauty in that area that he wanted to be a part of. So Humboldt University was what he decided on. In August of 2015, after DJ had been accepted into HSU, he was ready to get started. He had a plan of studying criminal justice. He actually wanted to use that to eventually go into law school. He wanted to be a lawyer one day to help his community. And again, he was so excited about all of this because he was setting a great example for his younger siblings. 
So as soon as he started going to HSU, he fit in right away. He instantly made friends. He was such a well-rounded individual. He liked snowboarding. He liked skateboarding. He liked going to the beach. He could play guitar. He got along with absolutely everyone that he met. And on top of that, he found a great home for himself at HSU when he became a part of a cultural group called Brothers United. The first year went amazing. Now his second year that started in August of 2008, 16 he decided this time he wanted to move off campus he had a few young women that he was really close friends with and they all decided to get a house together and that same month things got even better when he met a young woman named Ren and they started dating the next few months went smooth from my understanding but unfortunately that spring something awful happened and years later, there is still no justice. Now I'm going to go ahead and be very clear before I dive into any of this. There are obviously, as with any other true crime case or pretty much anything ever, there are multiple sides to this story. Obviously, we do not know which one is correct or someone would probably be charged at this point. I am just an average citizen. I cannot tell you what is correct and what is not. I've done the best research that I possibly can, so I'm going to be stating all sides that I have found. On April 15th, 2017, DJ went with his girlfriend, Ren, his roommate, and Alicia, and two brothers, Kyle and Christoph Castilla, to a party on 1120 Spear Avenue. And this was an off-campus party. It wasn't very far away from the school. Arcade is not exactly a huge place to begin with. They got to the party at around 2 a.m. So it was already in the early morning hours of the 15th. And they were greeted with about 100 party goers. And this was a small one-story house. So obviously I wasn't there, but I'm assuming this, house, this party was inside, outside. People were spilling everywhere. There's just it's not very likely everyone was inside of the house. So the group of five stayed at the party for around an hour and they decided at around 3 a.m. that they were gonna call it quits and they were gonna head out of the party. Now around 3 a.m. when they headed out of the door, they came face to face with a woman named Lila Ortega and her 23 year old boyfriend named Kyle Zollner along with three of their friends. Now, this is where there's multiple different stories involved. Apparently, sometime during the party, Lila realized that she had lost her gold iPhone 7. And according to many witnesses that were at the party, she was not pleased about this. And she believed that someone had either outright stolen the phone from her, or maybe she had misplaced it and someone picked it up and just didn't make any effort at getting it back to the owner. So she allegedly started going around the party and began accusing people of taking her cell phone. And a large portion of the witnesses claimed that she was mainly going to the black men in the party, accusing them. When she couldn't locate her cell phone, she decided to call her boyfriend, Kyle Zollner. He was at the apartment, I believe, that they shared together. She described the situation to him that she couldn't find her phone. He was also the DD for her and her friends that night, so he was coming to get them anyways. So he went ahead and had it over to help her figure out where her phone was. So when these two groups met face to face, that's exactly what happened. Some individuals claim that Kyle simply asked DJ's group if they had seen the phone, that he was respectful when he first came up to them. Um, others claim that Lila immediately hit the ground running, accused the group directly of stealing the cell phone, and even told them to turn out their pockets. Kyle Castilla, who was with DJ's group of friends that night, has testified that he turned to Kyle after Lila accused them of stealing and turned out their pockets and said, look, you need to get your girl. She doesn't know me like that. No, how could you accuse me of anything when you have no idea who I am? At this point, some reports state that Lila and Ren, because of this tension, immediately got into some sort of altercation. And this caused DJ, Ren's boyfriend, to get in a fight with Kyle, Lila's boyfriend. Another claim reports that someone from DJ's group initiated the attack and actually punched Kyle directly in the face. And then at that point, a massive brawl broke out. So apparently during this fight, over 15 people ended up outside brawling. Like this was a pretty large fight. And two young women from Lila's group decided to start spraying pepper spray, um, from my understanding, in an attempt to get everyone to break 
break it up. At this point, Kyle, I believe, was just being kicked repeatedly and hit repeatedly, and all of his friends and his girlfriend stated that they had to throw themselves over his body to kind of prevent him from getting hurt any further because their claim is that he was knocked unconscious. So this pepper spray, I believe, was like this last attempt at getting everyone to break it up. So it ended up working, and DJ and his group of friends all headed out. They walked down the driveway, and when they got to the end of it, Ren has stated that she realized in that moment, finally, that she had been pepper sprayed, that when they got to the end of the driveway, they all kind of realized their faces were burning, and this infuriated Ren. So she turned around, went back up to the house to confront the two women who had been pepper spraying everyone. So Ren's off now at this point, going to speak to these two women. DJ and the rest of the friends are all at the end of the driveway. And a young man named Paris Wright left the house after this fight had cleared up. I don't know if he participated or not, but he came down to the end of the driveway planning to leave. He was a friend of DJ, so he stopped and was like, hey, I just want to let you know that Ren's up there. He said, okay, cool, I'll go get her so we can leave. So at this point now, DJ also walks back to the house. Paris stated that a few moments later, as he was walking towards a car to leave, he all of a sudden heard screaming in the background, women screaming. And so he turned around and ran back to the house. Now his account of these next few moments is very important because it seems to be kind of like one of the only accounts of exactly when DJ ended up being stabbed. Harris Wright claims that when he got up to the house, he noticed that more fights had broken out again. At this point, Ren was fighting with Lila and her friend Naya, um, that had been one of the girls that was pepper spraying everyone. And then he looked over to the side and saw that DJ and Kyle Zollner were fighting again. Harris Wright said that DJ was laying flat on his back on the ground. They were fighting beside this red 1990s Mustang. Kyle was laying on his back on top of DJ as well. And DJ apparently had Kyle in a chokehold. Paris said at this point he panicked because he felt like DJ may have snapped and he wanted to stop DJ from doing something stupid. So he went over to try to break them up. When he finally got Kyle and DJ separated, he said that DJ wasn't letting go. Um, he reached his hand out to help DJ up and got this blank stare back at him. And when he looked closer, he saw blood. Um, and upon further investigation, he saw that DJ had what appeared to be a stab wound on his left hand. People from the party began to pour outside. Other friends of DJ's realized at this point that he was on the ground bleeding profusely. Um, so someone began to put pressure on the one wound and another friend that was experienced in CPR began to perform CPR on DJ. Another individual called 911 to report what had happened. And while there's all these people that are standing there trying to figure out what's going on, attempting to save DJ's life, witnesses stated that Lila stood over DJ's body that was bleeding out and said, and I quote, I hope that insert racial slur here, dies. At 3.05 a.m., officers radioed in that they had been notified that a woman had been stabbed at the house um, and multiple units were responding to the scene. So I don't know if there were multiple people that had called 911. Um, or what exactly is going on, but within a few minutes, police arrived and they did confirm that it was actually a male and this male was confirmed down. Now, I have seen that Ren possibly had a stab wound on her arm. I know that she did go to the hospital because they had to treat a bite on her breast from the fight. And it does mention that there was an injury on her arm, but I cannot say for a fact it was a stab wound. Um, but she also was injured during this. At 3.10 a.m., the scene was secure, according to what police said over the radio, and they did say that CPR was in progress on DJ. By 3.14 a.m., so we're talking almost 15 minutes after police arrived, they called in again to report that they were dealing with a very aggressive scene and they needed backup, and those backup officers were en route by 3.21. So we have about a 20-minute span where apparently it was just absolute chaos, according to all of the witnesses, for the most part, that have come forward in regards to what was going on during this time frame. 
So according to those at the party, the officers seemed very overwhelmed from the moment they stepped foot on the scene. Um, a lot of the different black individuals at the party claimed that it was clear these police officers felt intimidated by them or threatened by them. These officers were apparently way more concerned about crowd control and getting the party under control that people had to start yelling at them to go and see DJ. They were like, you know, go and see him. This guy is on the ground bleeding out. Do something instead of trying to disperse this party. This party is nothing compared to this young man that is about to die. And it took 15 minutes for an ambulance to arrive and finally take DJ quite literally just down the road to Mad River Community Hospital. Witnesses were infuriated because the hospital was not far away at all. You didn't even have to turn. There were no turns involved. And nobody could understand why it took so long for someone to come and help. While all this was going on, Annalisha called DJ's mom. I think it was right around when authorities arrived to let her know that DJ had been stabbed and was hopefully on his way to receive some sort of medical care at the hospital. At around 3.30 a.m., DJ's mom was able to call Mad River Community Hospital to try to inquire about his status. I think she had to leave a voicemail. She wasn't able to reach anybody, and she began trying to find a way to get from Southern California all the way to Northern California. Unfortunately, at around 4 a.m., Charmaine finally received a call where she was told that they did everything that they could, but unfortunately, DJ had passed away at 4.07 a.m. He had suffered, I believe, six separate stab wounds, one going directly into his heart. What Arcata police did at the crime scene is kind of a big blur because there was so much going on. Um, but what I do know is they ended up telling potential witnesses to leave. Now, when they arrived, there was still well over 50 party goers at this home. And before attempting to question everyone responsible or at least jot down people's names and numbers so they could contact them after the fact, or even attempt to see if anyone got any cell phone footage, video footage, whatever, they were directly telling these individuals to leave the party. So they mainly just spoke to all of DJ's direct friends that had been involved in everything, as well as Kyle's friends. Now, authorities apparently did speak to these different individuals that night and got all of their kind of different stories and statements, and they also did a quick search of the scene, and they were able to find a 10-inch kitchen knife underneath the red Mustang, and this was believed to potentially be the murder weapon. So right away, Kyle Zollner was arrested and charged with murder. So as you can see, this kind of sounds like a pretty cut and dry situation at first, um, but unfortunately, it turned into a disaster for absolutely everybody involved. On May 1st, 2017, a preliminary hearing was held for Kyle. And at this point in time, it was a very difficult time to have this preliminary hearing because most of the evidence was still being analyzed. But because you do have a time limit after being arrested to have your preliminary hearing, they had to move forward without all of this evidence. During the preliminary hearing, there was a pretty important testimony by a young man named Jason Martinez. He testified that he was watching when DJ was stabbed. Jason testified that he saw DJ and someone that he was unable to identify having a confrontation outside of the party. Now, while he was watching this go on, he remembered hearing someone say, oh shit, he has a knife. As soon as he heard this, he looked back over to DJ and this unidentified person and said that he saw this person take their right hand and make kind of jabbing motions towards DJ's left hand hip and his chest. Another witness, however, named Casey Gleaton testified as well. And this put some weight into the idea that Kyle was potentially responsible. She said that the day following the murder, she was at the apartment where Lila and Kyle lived together. And that while she was there, Lila went down to Kyle's car, which by the way, authorities allowed someone to drive the suspect's car and all of his belongings home after this. Um, without checking it for evidence. Just wanted to throw that out there real quick. Uh, but she went down to this car and brought back a bag of 
knives, like butcher knives. And Casey Gleaton testified that when Lila started going through the bag, she was like, there's only three knives in here. There's supposed to be four. So my assumption is that she believes this bag of knives was possibly used in the murder and that fourth knife was actually the murder weapon. But I have no idea if any police ever did any further digging into what Casey said, if they were able to have any sort of warrant out to check the apartment that Lila and Kyle shared. More witnesses did come to the stand and testify, but it seemed that despite all these different witnesses, first and foremost, a lot of them told very contradictory and conflicting statements. I mean, when you have a party with around 100 people, there's a fight involving at least 15 plus people and you have a very high chance of alcohol use, possibly drug use. You can see how things can get a little cloudy, um, but mainly not a single person could say for sure that they saw Kyle with a knife that night. So on May 5th, Judge Dale Reinholston decided to just dismiss the charges. He said, and I quote, we know Josiah was killed. We know he was killed by a knife and we know somebody at the party did it. But I don't think at this point we have sufficient reason to think the defendant did it. He claims that without the evidence available and with witnesses contradicting each other, he just didn't feel comfortable putting it through to trial. And I think the only evidence they really had at the time of this preliminary hearing were fibers that had been found on this 10 inch knife. And when these fibers were compared to the clothing and things that Kyle was wearing that night, it was not a match. So, so far the only kind of big piece of evidence they had did not point towards Kyle. But everyone was infuriated. The community and DJ's family felt like authorities did not do the proper job to ensure that his killer was brought to justice. A person that clearly had absolutely no hesitation to stab someone multiple times. And in a college town where there's frequently parties, there's obviously this fear that this puts other students in danger. Could this ha happen again? The police work was just not done at all. At the time, uh, I believe only 25 of the 100 plus partygoers had been questioned. I will state that because of a major lack of trust uh, with the police, I can only assume that a lot of these different partygoers just did not feel comfortable going forward. Um, however, also with police simply telling witnesses to leave the scene of the crime, they really created an even more difficult situation for themselves. It just felt like DJ's case was being swept under the rug. Shortly after the murder, when police and family were asking for tips, they did receive an anonymous email. And in this email, this person claimed that they were a witness to the murder and they basically had all the information that police were supposed to be looking for and they needed to figure out who killed DJ and prosecute them. Authorities made many pleas for this individual to come forward and hand over this information, but from my understanding, they never did. In November of 2018, Charmaine sued Arcata Police Department and Kyle was threatening to sue Arcata Police Department. There's so much to the story that I really suggest you guys go and look into on your own. There is so much work that has been put in by different organizations and by DJ's mom to really kind of highlight what exactly was going on during this time period. Kyle's uncle was repeatedly writing open letters to the city of Arcata, speaking to them about what was going on from their perspective. And this is a prime example of the horrors of what happens when police do not properly do their job. Someone that is possibly innocent can be framed as guilty and it can change their life forever. A family that wants justice for their loved one can't get it because there's just not enough evidence and things out there to find someone guilty under what is required of the judicial system. Or someone that's guilty ends up being found as innocent because there's just not enough to prove it and they get to walk off. It just puts you in this awful conundrum and harms everybody possible along the way. So Charmaine sued Arcata, the city of Arcata and Arcata Police Department and other officials claiming that they violated her 14th Amendment, which is a right to equal protection. She also said that they inadequately and incompetently investigated the case. And she also claimed that racism and discrimination contributed to their indifferent policies and practices. She believed that because her son is black and the suspect is white, that 
they kind of from the get go didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, She has claimed that during the preliminary hearing, the DA that was supposed to represent her son basically just built up a case for the defense. I mean, there's just so many things that you can get into that will take you just days of researching and reading to really understand the depth of everything that is going on here. Now, during this time period, while this civil suit is being filed, they're obviously still advocating for DJ and getting answers and also changing the way the Arcata Police Department works. There's students from HSU that are trying to push the college to make it a lot safer for them. And also a former FBI agent named Tom Parker was brought in by Arcata Police Department to help look into DJ's case. Now, while looking into this case, he noticed that the chief at the time, Tom Chapman, and there were actually three total chiefs so far to this day that have kind of come and gone, Um, but he noted that he knew absolutely nothing about the crime. Whenever Tom Parker would go to the chief and ask about it, he would have absolutely no idea. And that kind of said a lot to Tom because this is a huge case. Um, It is all over the media. You have protests and marches all over town. They were coming into city, people were coming into city meetings to demand justice for Josiah, yet the chief of police had absolutely no idea what was going on in the case. He also, after further review, accused the city of having very established practices of treating black homicide victims and investigations differently. He saw a pattern long before just DJ. It was not just DJ and it's still not just DJ. This is something that this police department has a long history of. He eventually resigned out of frustration. He was so upset because he said Arcata police had been very dishonest with him from the start. He came in with good intentions. They basically tried to hush everything that they possibly could. And then when he finally pointed them out on all the things he suggested they do and change, And just not just with this case, but in the entire department, they outright refused to follow his advice. So he said, forget it. If you're not going to listen, I'm not going to help you anymore. Interestingly, within 24 hours of Tom Parker's resignation, Chief Tom Chapman also resigned. And to me, that says a lot without even needing to say anything. On November 9th, 2018, DA Maggie Fleming received the case from Arcata Police Department to review it. It basically had been bumped up, moved up because the police department felt they just couldn't do any more with it. There were so many upset people, fresh eyes, whatever you wanna call it. And she made multiple statements claiming that it was going to take at least a few weeks to gather all the information that was needed to complete the investigation. February 28th, 2018, and 19, so just a few months afterwards, Maggie Fleming did decide to take the case to a criminal grand jury. Now, 19 members were brought onto the jury and they heard from, I believe, 25 separate witnesses and professionals, including forensic analysts. And I think 12 of them had to vote basically to move the case forward for it to continue on. All of the transcripts and everything from criminal grand juries are sealed, period. And it is very rare that they decide to unseal them. But according to an article on NBC News, a more recent one, apparently the jurors learned during all of this that DNA testing had been done on the knife. Now we already know that the particles or the fibers that were found on the knife did not match the clothing that Kyle had been wearing that night. There was also apparently a fingerprint on there and it was an identifiable fingerprint, but I have seen that it did not belong to Kyle either. But according to this article and DJ's mother, the jurors learned that DNA testing had been done on the knife and there were two sets of DNA. First and foremost, they were able to prove that it was in fact the murder weapon because it was DJ's blood on the knife. And the second set of DNA belonged allegedly to Kyle. Now I want to say this, take it with a grain of salt. This is very compelling information. I understand that, but I've only seen that on this article and what his mother has stated. I have not seen the DA announce that publicly or the police department or anyone, Um, but this is what his mother claims that she has been told by multiple DAs is that this evidence was in fact found and this is what came out during the grand jury. 
Now, apparently these two separate forensic analysts were there specifically for that reason. They essentially told the jury that just because DNA like that is on a knife does not mean that the only explanation is that it got there because that is who killed DJ. Ultimately, it was decided that Kyle would not go to trial for the murder of DJ Lawson. So after this whole grand jury, after I believe a couple of weeks of going through everything, the jurors can ask questions. I mean, you name it. So again, people continue to rally to fight for DJ. Jurors ended up coming forward, at least two of them, after the criminal grand jury ended because they were very unhappy with how everything went. In a criminal grand jury, you are not there to decide if someone is guilty or not guilty. It's not like someone is on trial. You're simply there to determine if there is enough probable cause to believe that a crime was committed and that there is enough evidence and everything will move forward. Now, one juror that anonymously came forward afterwards was very upset and said that they were shocked after this decision was handed down, they felt like they had completely failed. They, they said that the 19 different jurors only deliberated for six hours and that apparently a lot of the jurors were under the impression that they were in a regular trial and they were having to prove you know, guilty or not guilty. So they believe that the only reason it went that way is because these jurors were simply confused and not understanding exactly what they were trying to find. Another juror ended up going to DJ's mom directly and said that 13 of the jurors, so past the limit to push the case forward, originally were all planning to vote to try Kyle Zollner for the murder of DJ, but apparently a DA introduced the idea of self-defense um, and kind of came in and apparently began just confusing people. This juror was upset because during everything that they had learned, Kyle had never claimed self-defense. That is not something that he personally brought up, nothing that had ever been mentioned until things were swaying towards putting him to trial. And then all of a sudden this idea popped up. And as soon as that happened, the votes went the other way. People confronted DA Maggie Fleming about it, saying that, they were just so tired of seeing them repeatedly fail DJ. Maggie Fleming stated that she refused to present the case again unless they had an actual eyewitness that could contribute. She also defended the grand jury saying that it is required by law to introduce the possibility of self-defense to the jury. After all, there was an altercation um, when this was going on. DJ's friends had admitted that, Kyle had admitted that. So when you have a fight like that going on, it is very possible that self-defense played a part. So essentially there was nothing that anybody could do. In February of 2020, the National Police Foundation, which is a nonprofit from Washington, DC, were brought in to review not just DJ's case, but the police department as a whole and their policies. When the investigation was complete, they did determine that they believed officers responded as quickly as possible and as professionally as possible to the scene of the crime that night at the party. Um, but they said they did the best they could under this high chaos scene that would be difficult for any agency, no matter the training to deal with. But they still felt despite that, that there were plenty of changes that could be made. I believe they had 36 recommendations to be exact. So their first issue they had was that the city never provided proper training to the officers for them to handle this type of homicide scene. So these officers responding to this party were not at all prepared for what they were about to walk into. And because they had not been provided the training, they just kind of had to go with what they felt was the best thing to do at the moment because of that. The commanding officer the night of the stabbing also had absolutely no specialized training and crime scene management. Um, the lead investigator had no prior experience with homicides. They told suspects to leave on top of that. They allowed witnesses to take the suspect's belongings afterwards. Someone came and picked up his car. They also used absolutely no 
specialized evidence collection gear when they were collecting things. The crime scene was also not cordoned off properly at all. From my understanding, there was an area where it is believed that DJ was stabbed and that he didn't go down right away, but he eventually ended up in the place where he was found. Now, there were two very obvious spots where these things occurred, um, and they only cordoned off the area where DJ was found and not what is believed to be the actual murder scene where he was stabbed on the adjacent lawn beside his body. So when people went to revisit the scene or go back to check for other evidence, they didn't even look at the place where DJ was actually killed. There were also a lot of issues with the witnesses and even taking the witness statements. So not only did they not question everyone that was there at the party, but when they did question them, they wrote down things that were entirely different. I didn't write down the specifics of this just because there were so many, which says a lot, but there were multiple instances where a witness would directly tell police, no, I didn't see a knife or something of the sorts. And the officer would write down, they saw a knife. That's not an exaggeration. That is literally one of the things that they wrote wrong in the reports. There was one witness that was friends with the suspect who apparently changed her story three to four separate times, like entirely changed it. And for some reason, nobody ever went back to clear up all of the discrepancies. The investigator that ended up being assigned to the case apparently did not go to the crime scene nor did he look at any of the crime scene photos before sitting down with Kyle, who was being held because he was being charged with the murder of DJ. But this investigator did not know much about the scene or anything before speaking to him. And that does absolutely nobody any good in that situation. And apparently the interview with Kyle was also only 15 minutes long. From what I've seen, Kyle was apparently open to answering questions. Um, he was speaking to them, so it wasn't like he wouldn't talk and that's why the questioning ended. It was literally just an issue of them not performing properly an exploratory investigation. Uh, it was even told to Dateline in an interview that they didn't have the luxury to speak to the suspect longer because other things needed to be done. Basic crime scene security measures were not followed. Leadership was not provided, leading to many errors. And there's even more than what I just stated here. There's a whole 65 page write up on it. And all of this led to missteps in the investigation, holes in the investigation, lack of communication in the investigation, which has now led to the investigation remaining unsolved. Within hours, apparently, the DA even offered to help assist in this case and Tom Chapman declined. And many people believe he declined because he wanted to be the one to handle it all. He did not want to hand over the trophy basically to anyone else. And then unfortunately it didn't go his way. So he just resigned. As I said, they did provide 36 different recommendations to the police department in order for them to resolve a lot of the issues that they found in just this one case alone. I know that they have implemented at least 34 out of the 36 of them. After the grand jury declined to move the case forward, Charmaine attempted to have the case moved up to the general attorney. I do know that the DA, Maggie Fleming, also went to the GA and asked them to take over the case. And she said that the media had created a conflict of interest so she didn't feel she could do this case any justice anymore. However, the GA said that there was absolutely no conflict of interest and they were not going to take over the case. Ultimately, the city ended up settling the lawsuit with Charmaine. I believe they gave her $200,000 but refused to admit any wrongdoing and she refused to cash the check because she said she was not going to accept blood money. They also agreed with Charmaine to make a mural for DJ and donated $25,000 to a scholarship that was created in DJ's honor for his love of education and supporting those that needed it. This scholarship was created in part by Charmaine and Justice for Josiah, along with the Eureka branch of the NAACP. And essentially they give $500 to three students that live in Humboldt County or who went to Josiah's high school. So as I said, there is a group called Justice for Josiah and they do a ton of work and I highly suggest you guys go and check it out. The last I checked their website was under construction, but I'm hoping they get it going soon. I'm hoping they will accept 
donations and things like that because they do so much good work. There are monthly marches and vigils. They hold annual book bag drives. They feed those in need. They serve the community pretty much any way they possibly can and they do it all to honor Josiah. Charmaine also, DJ's mom, also runs a Facebook page that I have linked down below where she speaks a lot about the things that she is doing to create a difference in the community and make sure that the police department and these different officials are held accountable. You can go and follow the Facebook page to see if there is any way that you can help. If you are local, again, they do so many things in the community and monthly, I'm sure they will always accept a new helping hand. Kyle Zollner also has filed a lawsuit against the city of Arcata and the Arcata Police Department. He's claimed a lot of different things in his lawsuit. He is apparently representing himself, um, but one of the large things is that he claims that APD has some sort of um, policy that they put in place and I think 2017, where it essentially says that they are not allowed to investigate uh, students of color that go to HSU because they rely on, you know, these students of color coming to the university to provide diversity to the community. It says that because of that, there were never any other individuals at the party that were investigated. However, APD has come forward and said that there is absolutely no such policy in place at all. So it also states that he was held for two hours in police custody on scene, despite the fact that he was not fully conscious and was badly injured and needed medical attention. He claims unlawful arrest and detainment, malicious prosecution, wrongful threat uh, of criminal prosecution. Um, I believe that all kind of started in 2021. And it said that they were supposed to have some things kind of happen again in June or July, but I have not seen any updates as to where his civil lawsuit against Arcata and the police department stand. If I ever find anything, I will let you guys know. So as of now, I know that Tremaine and the new chief of Arcata have come forward and they have stated that the one thing that will push this case forward is a witness. Um, DA Maggie Fleming is not running again. So according to the Facebook page, at least that's what I I saw so they will not have to deal with Maggie Fleming anymore um, so maybe someone else would be willing to either try the case again or push someone to investigate further. Only half of the individuals that attended that party that night have been questioned still to this day. That means 50 plus people that were there have not come forward to identify themselves as being at the party and to speak about what they did or did not see and honestly that is incredibly gut-wrenching because that that has to be weighing heavy on a lot of people's minds. And I know that people are maybe worried that they somehow will get in trouble for being at the party, or they're worried that because they haven't come forward at this point, that something will happen to them. But the current chief and Charmaine have said, you know, look, we are not looking to get anyone in trouble. We just want someone with answers to come forward. Because at this point, someone at this party killed DJ. They stabbed him six times. And I find it so hard to believe not a single person there saw someone do this. When you have that many people at a house, like I said, there's no way all of them were inside. These people had to be flooding out everywhere in front of the house, in the back of the house, especially with fights going on. That immediately is going to draw everyone's attention to that area. Somebody had to see something. And I really hope one of these 50 individuals that holds the answer will come forward and say something to police. As I said, there's so much more to this and you could honestly go on a really deep dive on all of the different issues that have happened in Humboldt County um, and all of the different struggles that people of color have faced at Humboldt State University. There's a documentary on this. I have a lot of great resources down below. If you have any information on what happened to DJ that night, if you are able to identify who stabbed DJ that night, or have any information at all that you think may be able to help authorities. I have all of that information down below so you can get all of that into the right hands. There is a way to do this anonymously. I know there was a $55,000 reward out there, so that's a big amount of money. 
All they need is information that leads to the arrest and the prosecution of whoever killed DJ and that money will be given to you. On that note, I'm gonna go ahead and go you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to DJ's story. Make sure that you don't stop here. Go and support these different organizations that are now working really hard in Northern California and other areas to make sure things like this don't happen again. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.